So here is chapter six, and this is um, all on the skeletal system, your bones and joints. And this will be a great review or supplement to what we're doing in lab this week. If you've already had lab, you'll see what I mean. Um, this will be just a really good help for that. Um, so the components of your skeletal system are your bones, all the cartilages um, that are located throughout the body, and all of your tendons and ligaments. So these are all the components of the skeletal system. Here are the bones of the skeletal system, um, kind of a summary of all the bones. As you're aware by now, if you've worked through those exercises, there's a lot more bones that aren't listed here. But um, in summary, you have the skull, the mandible, which is your jawbone, the hyoid, which is a free-floating bone that surrounds your larynx. Um, you have your sternum or breastbone. Looking at the anterior view of the skeleton, we have your ribs. The humerus is the upper arm. The radius and ulna are the two lower arm uh, bones that run parallel to each other. And then you have carpal bones in the wrist. The metacarpal bones are in the palms of your hand. And your phalanges are all the bones in your digits. Um, sacrum and coccyx are the end of the spinal column. Then we have a femur, the longest, the largest bone in the body. The patella is your kneecap. Your tibia and fibula are parallel to each other in the lower leg, much like the radius and ulna are parallel to each other in the lower, the forearm. And then your tarsal bones are your ankle bones, metatarsal bones are in the soles of your feet, and your phalanges are the toes, the digits, the bones in your toes. Uh, looking at the back, uh, the scapula is uh, the anatomical correct term for your shoulder blade. You can see your ribs here. The vertebral column are made up of, is made up of individual vertebrae. Um, you can see a better view of your sacrum and your coccyx is the tailbone. Um, so this is just a rough overview of the bones in your skeleton. You will have to know these for lab and your lab exercises will take you through these. So what are the functions of your skeletal system? It helps to support parts of your body like your vertebral column. Um, it helps to protect important organs like your skull protects your brain, your rib cage protects your lungs, your heart. Um, thanks, Joe. Yeah, I will. I didn't get your email. If you could send that email to me again, Joe. Thanks. Um, they help work with movement. All of your muscles are connected with your bones. So when your muscles contract, they'll move your body. They're important in storage. They store certain um, minerals like calcium and blood cells. Your, all your blood cells in the body are made in the bone marrow, which is in your bones. The extracellular matrix, again, is anything um, that makes up bone, cartilages, tendons, and ligaments. That's not the cell portion, so it's extracellular. Um, the extracellular matrix all of these are all made of, of connective tissues. So their characteristics of bone, cartilage, tendons, and ligaments are all determined by the composition of what makes up their extracellular matrix. Um, so depending on if we're talking about bone or cartilage or tendons or ligaments, the matrix will look a little differently. Um, it will contain, it will always contain collagen, ground substance, and other organic molecules, as well as water and any minerals. What is collagen that makes up this extracellular matrix? So collagen is a tough rope-like protein. Um, it helps to form, the bundles of collagen help to form your tendons and ligaments. Proteoglycans are also part of this ECM, we sometimes call it. These are large molecules consisting of many sugars or many polysaccharides attaching to and encircling a core protein. The proteoglycans can form large aggregates and attract water to them. And the extracellular matrix of tendons and ligaments, oops, sorry about that, uh, contain large amounts of collagen fibers, making them extremely strong, like ropes or cables. And tendons and ligaments are what attach your bone to bone and bone to muscle. So it's important that your tendons and ligaments are extremely strong and these large amounts of collagen fibers are laid on top of each other parallelly, um, like a rope or a cable to help assist in that strength. Uh, the extracellular matrix of cartilage contains collagen and proteoglycans. 
uh, cart collagen will help make the cartilage tough, whereas the water-filled proteoglycans help make it smooth and resilient. And this is important because cartilage will cover all the ends of your bones uh, to help reduce friction when your bones glide past each other. Um, especially in the knee joint, your near femur sits on top of your tibia. Uh, there's layers of cartilage uh, protecting those bones. And in the elderly or people who are um, runners or have used a lot of kind of um, a lot of stress put on their knees, a lot of that cartilage has been rubbed off, disintegrated, and that's what causes a lot of pain and usually warrants a knee replacement of some sort. Um, as a result, cartilage will be rigid, but it also springs back to its original shape after being bent or slightly compressed. Uh, so cartilage can kind of have the ability to bend and spring back to its normal shape. You have cartilage in your ears, and that's why your ears are bendy. And it's also an excellent shock absorber, which, which makes cartilage an excellent material um, for the ends of your bones as they're sliding past each other. The bone extracellular matrix um, contains collagen, minerals like calcium and phosphate. The collagen fibers give flexible strength to the bone and the mineral component of bone, the calcium and the phosphate gives bone compression strength or weight bearing strength. And that's important because your bones, um, especially your vertebrae, hold up the weight of your body or the upper half. Most of the mineral in bone is in the form of calcium phosphate crystals, which we call hydroxyapatite. Any questions so far? Moving a little too fast. Okay, thanks for the scrolling down to see your faces. Um, then we get to the shape classification of bones, and this will be a little bit of a review or an introduction to lab. There's four ways we classify bones according to their shape. Long bones are longer than they are wide. So an example of these would be the upper and lower limb bones, uh, your humerus, your femur, your radius and ulna, um, the tibia and fibula. Short bones are approximately as wide as they are long. So kind of think of a square cuboid shape, um, but not, they could be irregularly shaped as well. So short bones, examples of these guys are in the wrist and the ankle. Flat bones are relatively thin. They have a flattened shape to them. Um, these are your sternum. The bones of your skull are very flat and thin. Um, and then irregular bones include your vertebrae because they have lots of processes sticking out in every which way. Uh, your facial bones, your zygomatic bone, mandible, maxilla, these are irregular bones because their shapes don't fit into the, any of the previous categories. If we take a look at long bones, we have different anatomical um, words to describe the structures on long bones themselves. So if we're looking at this long bone, um, this is most likely probably the femur, could maybe be the humerus, what we're looking at, but most likely the femur. Um, so every long bone has a diaphysis, which is the shaft or the long part of the bone. So it's seen here. And then the epiphysis are the ends of the bones. Um, then the diaphysis, the shaft of the bone, the long part, there's compact bone tissue on the outside that makes up kind of um, the border of that. And then you'll have a medullary cavity, which is a hollow space uh, within the diaphysis itself. The epiphysis um, is made up of what we call spongy bone tissue. And we'll talk about what the difference is between spongy and compact, um, but spongy bone tissue has spaces in it and compact is compact bone tissue. So we have um, usually a, what we call a proximal epiphysis, which is located closer to where that bone attaches to the trunk. And then the distal epiphysis would be located distance further away. Um, so on the uh, distal end of that bone. You'll also have articular cartilage that covers both epiphyses, the proximal and distal. And this, the, like we said before, the proximal or the articular cartilage just helps to reduce friction um, when these bones articulate with other bones in joints. Um, you can also see here labeled the periosteum is the outer, the dense connective tissue outer covering of the bone. And the end osteum is the innermost, um, kind of the inside lining of that medullary cavity. 
medullary cavities where your red bone marrow will be contained when you're um, a, a juvenile, a young adult, and yellow marrow in adults. Uh, red bone marrow just means that it's creating red blood cells, and yellow bone marrow means that it's made of lipids or fats. Um, the last thing I'll just point out is this epiphyseal plate. And the epiphyseal plate is the growth plate where the bone will increase in length, which is what this next slide is about. So epiphyseal plate is the site of growth between your diaphysis and epiphysis. Um, you can kind of see here how the epiphyseal line will be a little different um, depending on if, whether it's a juvenile or adult. Um, but again, the epiphyseal plate is just the site of growth between the diaphysis and the epiphysis regions in the bone. Uh, the medullary cavity is the hollow center of the diaphysis. And again, it will be filled with red or yellow uh, bone marrow. And these, um, these, all these structures of long bone will go over again in lab. Again, you can see the compact bone kind of makes up the edges of the diaphysis and your spongy bone is located in the epiphysis, epiphysis regions. The periosteum is the outer membrane around the bone's outer surface made of dense connective tissue and the end osteum um, endo, that prefix means inside or within. This is the membrane that will line the medullary cavity. Okay, just holler out questions if you guys have any. More structures of the long bone. Um, you can see here how a young bone would um, compare with an adult bone. Uh, you can see here how the, how the adult bone, um, the compact bone is a little more detailed and uh, the epiphyseal lines are more detailed as well. The spongy bone also fills up more of the epiphysis region. And that's just because in the young bone, you're, the young bone um, bones are still growing rapidly, especially through puberty. And again, that area of growth in length occurs at these epiphyseal plates, which are located between the epiphysis, the ends of the bone, uh, and the diaphysis. If we look here at the picture on the bottom, this shows the adult bone um, and it's starting to point out what we call the osteons. And osteons are just individual units of compact bone. They're also known as haversion systems. This is just another great look at how compact bone um, kind of surrounds the medullary cavity. You'll also see here that um, the end osteum is often made up of spongy bone uh, with trabeculae. trabeculae. Trabeculae or trabeculae are just the um, kind of sponge-like interconnecting structures that give the hollow space appearance of spongy bone. You can see here that there are blood vessels running through bone. There's also nerves running through bone. So we say um, bone is highly vascularized because blood vessels will go through it. So the bone marrow um, is contained in cavities, like the medullary cavity. So bones will always contain cavities or spaces. Um, the large medullary cavity in long bones is within the diaphysis, as well as there will be smaller cavities located in the ends of the long bones, those epiphyses regions, and also in the interior of other bones that aren't long bones. These spaces are filled with soft tissue called marrow, and red marrow is the location of blood forming cells. So that's easy to remember. Red marrow is red. That's where your blood will form its cells. And yellow marrow is mostly fat. So that's where some of your lipids are stored. In newborns, um, most bones have blood making red bone marrow. And in adults, the red marrow in the diaphysis will be replaced by yellow bone marrow. Um, in adults, most of the red bone marrow will be located in the flat bones and the long bones of the femur and the humerus. So some differences between newborns and adults there and where their marrow is located, which makes sense. Newborns have a lot more growth to do, so they need um, a lot more space to be making red bone marrow for their red blood cells. The compact bone tissue is always located on the outer part of the diaphysis, so it'll be closest to the periosteum, that outer covering, um, and also thinner surfaces of other bones. It will be where the compact bone tissue is located. 
And compact bone is made up of what we call osteons, which is the structural unit of compact bone. These osteons are these little tiny circles. I'll have a better picture that'll blow this up. Um, but each osteon runs parallel to the diaphysis in that long bone. Um, so these little osteon, these compact bone structural units are running parallel with the diaphysis. They will have what we call lamella, which are the rings around the central canal where the blood vessels go through. Um, lacunae, a lacuna is just a space, a hollow space where an osteocyte, a bone cell, will sit. So an osteocyte, the suffix site means cell, and the prefix osteo has to do with bone. So osteocyte is a mature bone cell, and osteocytes just hang out. They reside in these spaces in compact bone called lacuna. Um, think of a cocoon, but a lacuna, if that helps you remember it. Um, Canaliculus are just interconnection kind of channels between the lacuna that allow the osteocytes to communicate and the central canal is where all your blood vessels and nerves will travel through. Uh, the lamella will be concentric or rings around that cent uh, central canal. Uh, here describes the lacuna. There are spaces between the lamella, the canuliculus or canuliculi for a uh, plural, say that word 10 times fast. Uh, those are the tiny channels that connect the lacuna together. They will transport nutrients and remove waste between osteocytes and then the central canal is the center of the osteon where your blood vessels will be. Okay, so this is maybe a better picture of everything I just described, but it's zoomed in. Um, so this is under a light microscope at 400 times magnified. Um, this is a central osteon compact unit of bone. So there's your osteon. And then this is an artist's rendition of what it would look like. Um, so here's the central osteon. You can see the central canal running through the middle of the osteon, and you can see a little tiny blue vein and red artery running through that. And then these little purple ovals or gray, they're dark black in the light microscopy picture. Those are the osteocytes um, in the spaces in the lacuna. And then you can see these rings of lamella. The rings are just surrounding. They're the rings of compact bone tissue that surround the central canals. Uh, traveling up through the central canals are blood vessels. And again, they all run parallel with the diaphysis. But in order for those blood vessels to communicate and to connect with each other, they run through um, areas called perpend perpendicular or per per perpendicular canals. Um, and those are not labeled in this picture, but it's just the canal um, that's shown here where the central canal arteries are being connected by. What else in this picture? You can see the canuliculi maybe better in the light microscopy picture. The canuliculi kind of look just like little spider. I, I think it looks like little um, spider legs coming off of the lacuna. And again, they will interconnect the lacuna together to allow for communication between osteocytes. Questions on the structure of bone tissue? Okay. All right, then when we talk about spongy bone, um, this is located at the epiphyses of long bones. And again, the epiphyses are the ends of the long bones and also more centrally located in other bones. It has trabeculae, which are interconnecting rods of bone tissue and the spaces between the trabeculae contain marrow. Uh, so spongy bone does not have osteons. It is not made of those osteons, those parallel units of compact bone. So here's a look at what spongy bone looks like. Um, again, it'll be located not toward the exterior side of bones, but more in the central part of the bones. And these are the trabeculae, the rods of bone tissue. Um, and the spaces between the trabeculae will contain bone marrow and blood vessels. Um, Spongy bone is still made of osteocytes and still has lamella, but the lamella aren't surrounding a central canal. Um, this is just showing a picture, a zoomed in view of what a trabecula or one of those rods would look like if we cut it in half or took a cross section through it. So this is spongy bone tissue. Okay, 
Uh, bone cells, so they will all begin with the osteo prefix because osteo always has to do with bone. Um, we talked about osteocytes. Um, these will be cells that are kind of normal bone cells. They maintain the bone matrix. They form from osteoblasts after the bone matrix has surrounded it. And then we have osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And osteoblasts build bone. So think of this letter B, osteoblasts will build bone. They're responsible for the formation of bone and the repair and the remodeling of bone. So osteoblasts build bone. Try to say that 10 times to remember that one. And then osteoclasts will kill bone. I know I'm using the wrong letter, but the same sound. Osteoclasts kill bone, and that means um, they will remove existing bone called bone reabsorption. Um, so osteoclasts, they contribute to bone repair and remodeling by removing existing bone. Um, and in order to remove existing bone, there are specific cells that reabsorb it. So how many of you guys have had braces? Many of you, maybe some of you. I have not, so my teeth are not perfectly arranged. I feel like the kids who had braces had perfect teeth at the end. Um, so what the dentist is doing is he's using osteo, the activity of osteoclasts and osteoblasts um, to build up or kill off, remove, reabsorb your existing bone of your teeth and putting down um, where they want the teeth to be. So that's the activity of osteoblasts and osteoclasts. I think my daughter's gonna need braces. She had a tooth come in and it's all crooked. So thanks to my husband, I didn't need him, but anyway. All right, bone formation, ossification. So now we're gonna talk about how bones form um, and how bones increase in length and increase in diameter. Ossification is the formation of bone by osteoblasts. Remember osteoblasts build bones, so they will be involved in bone formation. And bone formation that occurs within connective tissue membranes is called intramembranous ossification. If bone formation occurs inside hyaline cartilage, we call that endochondral ossification. And we'll talk about those two differences. Uh, both types of bone formation result in compact and spongy bone. So intramembranous ossification occurs when osteoblasts will begin to produce bone within a connective tissue. And this mainly occurs in the bones of the skull. So intramembranous ossification occurs in the bones of the skull. Osteoblasts will line up on the surface of the connective tissue fibers and will begin building bone or begin depositing uh, the bone matrix to form those trabeculae of the spongy bone. Uh, intramembranous ossification, it'll begin in a central center called an ossification center. And then the trabeculae will radiate out from that center as bone is being built build up or formed. Um, usually two or more ossification centers exist in each flat skull bone and mature skull bones result from the fusion of these centers as they enlarge. And this is really common, um, especially in developing fetuses in the womb and especially um, a baby up to 12 months of age, they are forming um, these intramembranous ossification centers are fusing together as their skull bones are fusing together. Uh, the trabeculae are constantly remodeled and they may enlarge or be, re be replaced by compact bone later. So this is a look at bone formation in the fetus, um, just showing where the ossification center will exist and how the trabeculae or spongy bone will radiate out from the center of that ossification center to form a parietal bone, which is the bone on the sides of the skull. Um, this ossification center is forming the frontal bone. Uh, that's your forehead bone. Um, and you'll see kind of how these other skull bones are formed. Um, this fontanelle, again, is the word for the soft spot or the space between skull bones before they completely are fused together. And again, in a baby, the skull bones do not fuse together until they're uh, 12 months of age. So again, you don't want to drop a baby on its head. There's a soft spot on its head. There's also fontanelles on the sides, kind of where the temples are. There's also a so fontanelle in the back. Um, so really, these fontanelles are located wherever any of these skull bones will come together and fuse. 
Um, and before they come together and fuse, you just have um, a soft spot there, an area where skin and light connective tissue is covering the skull uh, before the skull bones will fuse together. Okay, it's kind of a cool picture there. Endochondral ossification. So that was intramembranous ossification. Um, endochondral ossification has to do with bone formation um, from a cartilage model. So this is where we start with a cartilage model and the cartilage will be replaced by bone. This is an endochondral ossification. Um, this usually occurs in your long bones. It's initially formed um, in a primary ossification center, which is bone formation in the diaphysis of a long bone. And a secondary ossification center will be bone formation in the epiphysis or the ends of the bone. So steps in endochondral ossification, uh, chondral blasts. So now we see a cartilage cell. The prefix chondro has to do with cartilage. So a cartilage building cell, a chondro blast, will build a cartilage model and the chondroblasts will become mature cartilage cells called chondrocytes. The cartilage model will eventually harden, and we call that calcification. Osteoblasts, which are our bone building cells, will invade that calcified, hardened cartilage, and the primary ossification center will form the diaphysis, the long part of the bone, and the secondary ossification center will form the epiphysis, um, the original cartilage model then will become completely ossified or turned into bone and the remaining cartilage will be the articular cartilage. And again, the articular cartilage is just the area uh, that will surround the epiphysis, the ends of the bones. So this is just kind of a picture of that. We start at um, number one. Um, this is a look maybe even of a fetal bone a fetal developing embryo bone. So this is showing how everything starts as cartilage and endochondral ossification of a long bone. And eventually um, the chondrocytes will enlarge, the cartilage will become hardened or calcified, the bone collar will be produced, which is the hard bone, bony matrix surrounding the bone. Um, the primary ossification center will form as blood vessels and osteoblasts invade it. The osteoblasts lay down in bone matrix. They build the bone forming the trabeculae and the secondary ossification center will form in the epiphysis regions of the long bones. So all the cartilage will eventually turn into bone. That's called ossification. And the cartilage that's left will just remain on the um, epiphysis, the ends of the bone. And we call that articular cartilage. Bone growth and width. So, oops, sorry about that. So bone growth occurs um, both lengthwise and also diameter wise. And we know that bones get long and your bones can also um, grow in their diameter. Bone growth occurs by the deposition of new bone lamellae um, onto existing bone or other connective tissue. These osteoblasts will deposit new bone matrix on the surface of bones between the periosteum and the existing bone matrix. And by doing so, the bone will increase its width or diameter. And bone growth in diameter is called apositional growth. If you can remember that, apositional growth is just growing the bone in diameter widthwise. Bone growth in length, then, it's the major source of increased height in an individual. Um, this will be bone, most of our bones grow the majority of their length during puberty. Um, this will occur in the epiphyseal plates. And again, those epiphyseal plates are just the areas between the epiphysis and the diaphysis and the long bones. And the type of bone growth that occurs through the bone increasing its length is the endochondral ossification model that we just talked about. Um, chondrocytes will increase in number on the epiphyseal side of the epiphyseal plate. Chondrocytes will get large, they'll die off, and the cartilage matrix will eventually become calcified, hardened, and then that cartilage will be replaced by osteoclasts, which will remove them, and then the dying chondrocytes will be replaced by osteoblasts, which will build more bone. So this is how bones will grow in length. I'll stop there. Questions? How are you guys feeling about this? Just a pull break, one to ten. Ten, I feel completely okay with this. One, I'm confused, we're going too fast. I guess you could put a negative number in if you're really confused. Thanks guys.
All right. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So kind of our third, our last slide in bone growth and length, these osteoblasts will start forming bone by depositing bone lamellae. Um, and again, this happens at the epiphyseal plate. Okay, so this shows, um, this actually takes us through the five, well, four different regions of epiphyseal plate bone growth. And it's showing here how um, the new cartilage will be produced closest on the epiphyseal side. And underneath the microscope, it's really fun. I think it's fun and interesting. You can see these zones of endochondrial bone growth at the epiphyseal plate. And what it shows you, these are cartilage cells. It's, it's hyaline cartilage here at the, up at the top. And it shows how these cartilage cells will stack up on each other in zone one. Um, they'll start to mature and get bigger. We call this the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. And then they'll eventually become calcified and hardened between kind of zones two and three. And then in four, the cartilage will be replaced completely by bone. So these zones of epiphyseal growth, um, if you go on and take them in anatomy, you'll probably know the specifics of each zone. Uh, but it's just kind of interesting to see under a microscope how you can see how cartilage chondrocytes um, will eventually be replaced by osteocytes in bone. So that is increase of bone length in your long bones. Uh, bone remodeling. So how do we remodel bones like in braces or um, just in general, your bones are constantly being remodeled because your osteoclasts that try to reabsorb bone maybe need to release more calcium um, into your blood. So that's the reason why we need our bones are being remodeled constantly. Also just to replace old dying osteocytes. So bone remodeling involves removal of existing bones by osteoclasts. Remember osteoclasts kill off existing bone. Um, deposition of new bone, your osteoblasts build bone. Uh, this, will, this type of bone remodeling occurs in all bones and it will be responsible for changes in bone shape, um, bone repair, adjustment of bones to stress, um, and also calcium ion regulation. So if you need more calcium in the blood, uh, your muscles need calcium to function. Um, your bones will be remodeled to allow more calcium to serve other purposes in your body. If you break a bone, your bones will need to be remodeled. Um, also, if your bones are adjusting to stress um, or constant um, weightlifting, weight-bearing exercises, they'll be remodeled as well. Bone repair. How many of you guys broken a bone? And if you want to share your broken bone story, just put that into the comment section. Um, in every class I've always taught, there's always been some crazy bone breaking story. Maybe this will be the first where there's not, but if you wanna share a bone breaking story into the comments and maybe I'll read it later on um, and we'll talk about it and discuss as I keep lecturing here. So throw, so throw your bone breakage stories into the comments. So how do we repair bones after a break? A broken bone will cause bleeding and a blood clot will form because like we said, um, your bones are highly vascularized. So there is blood going through your bones. A callus will form, which is a fibrous network between the two bony fragments where, where there's a fracture in them or a break. Cartilage model will form first. Osteoblasts will enter the callus and form the cancellous bone or the spongy bone. And this will continue for four to six weeks after injury. Um, the cancellous bone will be slowly remodeled to form compact and cancellous or spongy bone. Um, so again, this occurs, this process of remodeling occurs for four to six weeks, um, which is usually the bare minimum that people need to wear casks, casts for. So this is a complete fractured humerus and showing how the callus has formed around the fractured part. Um, I'm not sure, but this look, might be a young child because it looks kind of small, um, that arm. So this is how bone repair happens. If hematoma forms, which is a blood clot around the two fractured pieces. Well, I see we have lots of stories coming in. That's great. Um, the callus will form and then the callus will become ossified um, as the bone is completely remodeled. Um, there might be a slight 
not scar, but you might see a slight indentation where that cartilage or callus was, but otherwise the bone would be completely back to normal. So bone is a living tissue. It can become remodeled. Um, your bodies are amazing. Um, gymnastics, toe on a seesaw, hand, broke your nose twice. Oh. So you fell off a horse, two compound fractures, and you severed your artery. Wow, Jen. Six hip surgeries. Oh, Samantha. Total hip replacement. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so with that one, it actually all started from um, a softball injury, and they said I had scoliosis and wasn't even affecting my back. It was like growth plate was yeah. out of place. And they've had to like shave and twist my femur, put plates in, screws in, but I've never broken a bone. And now they just said a total hip replacement. So I don't have to keep going through uh, therapy, pain management, all this other craziness. Okay, wow. Oh man. Um, thank you for sharing. I'm glad you're okay or it's better. Um, yeah, Daisy, maybe you should get that checked out, your knee. Everything bothers you when you get older. You guys are all young. I'm feeling older. Dislocated clavicle does not sound nice, Larry. That sounds good. And then the felling, falling off the horse. Well, they all sound bad, but thank you for sharing, guys. Anyone else want to share? I'll give you a chance to talk. Are you serious, Daniel? Fighting three bears? Are you serious? No, okay. Okay. It's like, I don't think you would be here right now if you were fighting three bears. All right. Glad you guys are okay and are here now. Um, bone and calcium homeostasis. So um, we talked, to, calcium is a very important for different processes in your body, like your muscles, and bone is the major storage site for calcium. Um, so movement of calcium in and out of bone will help to determine the blood levels of calcium. So if your blood needs more calcium to um, use in your muscles, for example, it'll break down bone to release that calcium into the blood. Calcium moves into bone as osteoblasts build new bone. So that's how we store calcium um, in. Too much calcium can make bones brittle. Um, yeah, I think there's different things that can make bones brittle, Larry. I would have to look more into that. Too much of anything is bad, though. Chicago Bears fan. <laughs> oh. Is football even on for this season? I guess we have to wait and see. Football's a winter sport, right? It's on, yeah. It is. Okay. Has it started? Yeah, it's on its third week this week. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm glad it's back, though. Okay. Good. <laughs> Uh, my brother does fantasy football, I think, or something. Let's not start talking about sports. I'm not knowledgeable in that area. Okay. Um, yeah, Larry, brittle, yes. Too much calcium. Um, calcium moves out of bone as osteoclasts break bone down. Um, calcium homeostasis is maintained by two different hormones in the body, the parathyroid hormone and the calcitonin hormone. Um, you might not have to know now what each does, but to help you remember it, the calcitonin uh, tones down blood calcium levels. If that helps you remember what calcitonin does, it tones down blood calcium levels. So it would take calcium out of your blood and put it into bone. Uh, parathyroid hormone does the opposite. It increases blood calcium levels. Um, and I guess this does tell you a little bit what PTH does, that's the parathyroid hormone. Um, so parathyroid hormone will be activated when decreased, when there's decreased blood calcium levels in the blood. So that'll tell your parathyroid hormone to be released from your parathyroid glands, um, which are right below your thyroid gland, um, so kind of in the larynx area. Parathyroid hormone will stimulate or tell your osteoclast to break down bone and release calcium into the blood. So again, parathyroid hormone increases blood calcium level. In the kidneys, parathyroid hormone activity will increase calcium reabsorption from urine so that um, your kidneys will try to reabsorb excess calcium because some, somewhere in your body needs more blood calcium levels. 
Vitamin D promotes calcium absorption from your small intestine. We talked about that's why vitamin D is important. It helps to absorb calcium um, from your gut, from things that you eat. Increased blood calcium stimulation stimulates calcitonin. So if you have too much blood calcium, so too much calcium in your blood, um, your body will send out calcitonin from your thyroid gland to tone down blood calcium levels. What will calcitonin do? It inhibits osteoclasts, which just means it will allow the osteoblasts will take up the calcium from your blood to build up more bone. Um, so again, bone is a living tissue. It's constantly being remodeled, broken down, built back up um, to maintain calcium homeostasis in your blood. I got a question. Yeah. What's the best source of calcium? Because I don't know if it's true or not. I heard we shouldn't drink milk toward past a certain age. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, so that's where, I mean, we're getting into a lot. That's a huge, that's kind of a wide open question because there's a lot of people who say our bodies were never meant to digest milk to begin with. So that's why a lot of people don't drink milk at all. Um, yeah, these might be questions for, I feel like we have a lot of nutritionists in the group. The best source of calcium. Um, maybe from a personal experience, maybe what you drink or. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I kind of listen to my body, so I don't really crave milk anymore. So I feel like your bodies tell you what it needs and I don't really drink milk anymore because I don't really crave it. But especially as a woman, you need a lot of calcium um, to help with that. And vitamin D helps with that too, because as women get older, they could um, go through osteoporosis more easily. I just think their bodies go through a lot more of hormonal changes. Uh, broccoli is a big, um, has a lot of calcium in it, I believe. Um, Yum. I, I personally do not drink milk though. I mean, I, I like milk and cereal, but I, I don't drink like a glass of it. Yeah, I'm the same way. <laughs> you could do like kale and stuff like that as well. Yeah, kale, big, so at, like big, like dark green leafy vegetables. Fish. 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 Okay. Cool. Fish has calcium. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? I feel like you guys are the, I'm the science part of it, but you guys might be better at nutritionist sides. Wait, I take like fish oil every day. Does that have calcium in it? <laughs> I, what is that? I think the fish oils are more essential fatty acids, but then, uh, yeah, I think from what I remember, it's just kind of like the fish you don't want to eat. Like the sardines will have the calcium and all that. Oh, okay. I prefer like the kale and then the veggies, I guess. Yeah, calcium supplements are extremely important for women. Um, but yeah, I think fish oil is more of the fatty omega, the fatty acids. Yeah. Nothing wrong with taking supplements. I think it's good. Because I was on a prenatal vitamin for a while. Should probably still be taking that, but supplements are good. Um, okay, everyone's still with me so far. I think what we'll do is we'll try to get through. Um, just the axial skeleton, and then um, that's, that's all we're doing in lab this week. So we're going to start talking about bone anatomical terms, and this is a lot of this will be a review of lab. So a foramen is a hole, a fossa is a depression in bone, and if a bone has a process on it, that means it has a projection or a piece that sticks out from the bone. A condyle is a smooth rounded end of a bone. A meatus is some sort of canal like passageway and a tubercle is a lump or a bump on a bone. And again, I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly cause we'll talk about this literally in lab um, in a little bit. So let's get through axial skeleton. It's composed of your skull, your vertebral column and your thoracic cage. The skull has 22 bones um, that either are those of the uh, brain case that hold the brain, the cranium, and those of the face. Um, the cranium surrounds the cranial cavity and that consists of eight bones and the bony structure of the face has 14 facial bones. Uh, 13 of the facial bones are very solidly connected to form the bulk of your face, but the mandible is freely movable. And that's the only free, freely movable joint in the skull and it will connect to the skull with one of the um, cranium bones. So that's your mandible. The mandible needs to be movable, why? We can chew. So you can chew. So your mandible has the ability to move up and down via the masseter, other muscles, and that helps you chew. There's also three teeny tiny bones. They're called ossicles in each middle ear. 
and they're so tiny, they will all fit on a penny. They're that small. So here are the cranial bones, the frontal bone, parietal bones, there's, they make up the sides and the roof of the cranium. The occipital bone is in the back of the, the skull, and then temporal bones um, make up kind of surrounding where the ear would be. Uh, the sphenoid bone is a, a, a butterfly-shaped bone. It sits behind the eye, so it makes up part of the eye orbits. It has a cella turcica, which is a little depression, which is, holds your pituitary gland. And then the ethmoid bone hits right kind of between, um, between the eyes behind the nose. And that has what we call nasal concha in it. And we'll talk about what those are. The maxilla forms the upper jaw and the anterior part of your hard palate, also parts of your nasal cavity and the floor of your eye orbit. Uh, the maxillary sinus is a space or a cavity within the maxilla bone. So maxilla is singular, but maxillae is plural. So you actually have two maxilla, one on each side of the upper jaw, and they fuse together right in the middle. Um, so that's why maxillae, so you have two maxilla. Palatine bones um, form the posterior portion of the hard palate and also the lateral wall of your nasal cavity. Zygomatic bones are your cheekbones. You can feel your cheekbones and they will form the floor and lateral wall of eye, each eye orbit. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to kind of feel these bones on your face. Um, also, just to throw this out there, the, learning the skull and all the bones in the body is probably the hardest part of anatomy. Um, so you'll just want to spend some time with these words if, you, if they're unfamiliar to you. Lacrimal bones form the medial surface of the eye orbit, so they're on the inside of the eye. They have a groove within them that will drain all the tears that wash over your eyes constantly to help keep out bacteria. Nasal bones form the bridge of the nose. The vomer is one kind of plow-shaped bone. It's in the middle of the nasal cavity that helps to form the nasal septum, which is the wall um, that goes down your bone. The inferior, no, go, that goes down your nose. The inferior nasal concha are attached to lateral walls of the nasal cavity, and the mandible is your uh, lower jaw bone, and it's the only movable skull bone. So this is a look at your skull. The different bones are highlighted. Um, these pictures are a lot better in this PowerPoint than maybe would be in the lab exercise PowerPoints. So if you're trying to learn the, um, the bones of the skull, maybe you reference these uh, these pictures because the different colors helps to determine their differences. So here's the occipital bone on the back in blue. You have two parietal bones that go up the side. Um, the frontal bone is in the front and you have sutures which are fibrous joints that will be where skull bones, the bones of the cranium will fuse together um, at 12 months of age when you're born, after 12 months old after you're born. Um, so whenever you see a suture, and they're all named differently, we'll learn these in lab, the sutures are just where the two skull bones fuse together in what we call a fibrous joint. The fibrous joint is completely immovable, um, an immovable joint. Here's an example of a um, condyle, a rounded kind of process of a bone. This is the mandibular condyle, and it will connect to the temporal bone, giving that connection to the rest of the skull. A styloid process, any, anytime you see the word process, that means some sort of bony prominence or projection. And mastoid process, a mental foramen, here's a hole. So foramen means hole. You can see some of the other bones listed there as well. Um, a view of the skull from the front, you can start to see these concha, which are on the lateral sides of the nasal cavity. This is showing the middle and inferior nasal concha. The superior nasal concha, you can't see. Uh, from the nose itself. You can see here the bones that make up the orbit that we'll go over more in detail in lab. And again, the mental foramen um, are two holes on the exterior of the mandible in the front. Uh, the vomer is shown here. So going down the middle of the nose makes up the nasal septum or the wall. The perpendicular plate from the ethmoid bone makes up the top half of that nasal septum and the bottom half is made up of the vomer. Uh, this is what everyone loves, all the tiny little holes on the inside of the skull as we're looking down into the cavities. Um, the anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa just divide um, the base of the skull 
into different areas. And you can see here in purple, this is your sphenoid bone. It has a greater wing and a lesser wing, which are not labeled here. And then you have different foramen that are labeled. In lab, I'll tell you a hint of ROS that helps you remember rotundum ovale spinosum, these three foramen kind of in a line. Foramen magnum is the largest hole in the base of the skull and the um, spinal cord travels through that hole. There are other um, fissures, canals, meatuses, which all mean holes. Um, these holes are important to provide blood supply up to the brain. Um, also nerves uh, will travel through these holes. The ethmoid bone is shown in yellow. Um, the frontal sinus is shown. That's just a space or cavity within the frontal bone. A look at the skull from the, an inferior view or from the bottom up, we see um, occipital condyles, which are rounded parts of the occipital bone that'll balance on your first vertebrae of the vertebral column. And just a look at the uh, maxilla, how the maxilla um, forms um, the kind of anterior part of your hard palate and the palatine bone forms the posterior part of your hard palate. I know this is kind of quick, uh, but you will spend a lot of time in the lab going through these. Um, and I kind of want to try to get through the rest of the axial skeleton here before we break. Uh, paranasal sinuses are cavities um, within the skull. Um, they open into the nasal cavity. You have a frontal, an ethmoid, a sphenoid, and a maxillary sinus. And again, they are just cavities uh, based on which bone they're located in. So here's, here are the paranasal sinuses. And again, they are spaces or cavities. They provide buoyancy to the brain. Um, they also help in resonating sound. Um, so if you're sick and you have a sinus infection, you sound different uh, because you have an infection in these sinus cavities. And you normally these sinus cavities, you want them to be completely cleared out to help with resonating sound um, as you're speaking. Okay. Uh, the hyoid bone is an unpaired. That means you just have one of them. It's a U-shaped bone. It's not part of the skull. It does not have any bony attachment to the skull or any other bones. Um, it's unique because it doesn't articulate or touch any other bone. It provides an attachment for some tongue muscles and also an attachment point for important neck muscles that elevate your larynx. And your larynx is just another word for your voice box. Um, I mentioned this, um, the hyoid bone, yes, yeah, surrounds kind of the larynx. It's free floating here. Um, in, if you find a dead body in the woods and the hyoid bone is broken, um, not many of us will ever find a dead body in the woods, hopefully. I use that analogy many times throughout anatomy. But if you find a dead body in the woods and the hyoid bone is broken, that will most likely mean the person died of a strangulation um, because it surrounds the voice box or the top part of the trachea. So that's your hyoid bone. It has these horns or cornua, uh, which we'll talk about in lab. Vertebral column then is all of your vertebrae or spine. Um, it's the central axis of the skeleton. It extends from the base of the skull to slightly past the end of your pelvis. It consists of 26 individual bones grouped into five regions. There's four major curvatures to the spine, which are important. These curvatures of the spine help you sit up straight and walk on two feet, which makes humans different than most other animals. We're able to walk on two feet, and the curvatures of our spine help us do that by holding up the top half of our body. Uh, the cervical region curves anteriorly, thoracic curves posteriorly, and I'll show you how these um, kind of regions curve when we look at the spine itself. And then the vertebral column itself um, is divided this way, you have seven cervical vertebra, 12 thoracic, which attach to 12 ribs, five lumbar, one sacrum, and one coccyx. One professor um, had a way of remembering this that I learned from. You eat breakfast at seven, lunch at 12, and dinner at five as a way to remember how many vertebra are in each region, seven, 12, and five as you're working your way down. You have two special cervical vertebra. Um, the atlas is C1. This holds up your head. It's named after, I think, was it a Greek god or a Titan? Maybe some of you have seen that sculpture of the guy holding the world up on his shoulders. That was the atlas, his name. 
um, I don't know, I'm not into Greek mythology, but it was some something connected to that. And then the axis is the second vertebrae. Uh, functions of your vertebral column, and I'll eventually get to a picture, I promise. Um, it supports your body weight, protects your spinal cord, which is very important, um, a, allows spinal nerves to exit the spinal cord, provides a site of attachment for muscles, and provides movement of the head and the trunk. So here's a look at your vertebral column. You can see the seven cervical vertebra here with C1 and C2 being the first two. Uh, and then again, it also is showing the curvatures of the cervical region, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. Um, the coccyx is the tailbone at the end. So again, a normal curvature of the column, your spine isn't completely straight. You have this normal curvature that helps provide support to your head and upper body regions. Um, some people are hunchback. Most of us are probably the past seven months because we're all hunched over a computer um, keyboard. So try to work on your posture, that's important. Uh, a typical anatomy of a vertebra is shown here. The spinous process is what you feel if you run your um, finger along your spine, you can feel all the spinous processes of individual vertebrae. Um, the transverse processes kind of stick out perpendicularly to the spinous process. Chiropractors and some DO doctors will adjust your spine by pushing on the transverse processes because they can rotate the spine one way or the other. The body holds the intervertebral discs and the pedicles connect the bodies to the rest of uh, the vertebra. We'll go over the other structures in lab in a couple minutes. These are some regional differences between the cervical, lumbar, and thoracic vertebra. All cervical vertebra have holes in their transverse processes called transverse foramen. Um, the dens C2 has the um, dens, which is like a thumbs up structure that points um, superiorly. And that's what different ligaments are attached to to allow you to shake your head no. And the C1 atlas will have um, kind of smooth processes or facets for your occipital condyles of the skull to sit on. Um, the thoracic vertebra has kind of a medium sized body and the lumbar vertebra has the really thick sized body for lumbar vertebra. The sacrum and coccyx are fused vertebra that in development verte ver vertebrae fuse together to form the sacrum and coccyx. Um, the sacrum has different anatomical features of it that we'll go over in lab and the coccyx is just your tailbone and I'll tell you a fun story about breaking your tailbone in lab. Not personally. A uh, thoracic cage protects vital organs, your lungs, your heart. There's 12 pairs of ribs. They connect to the 12 thoracic vertebra. The sternum is your breastbone that goes down the front. You have true ribs that are attached directly to the sternum by cartilage. False ribs are attached indirectly to the sternum by cartilage. And you have two floating ribs, numbers 11 and 12, which are just hanging out in your back that are not attached to the sternum at all. And you can see that here, ribs one to seven, are directly connected to your sternum via cartilage. False ribs are connected to the sternum via kind of indirectly to, with cartilage and 11 and 12 are floating. If you break a rib, fracture a rib, you just kind of have to let it heal on its own. Um, and we heard through bone remodeling that that is possible. So let's break there and I'm gonna stop this PowerPoint. Stop.